ISIS has done a really good job of recruiting people. So what they're looking for, there's a lot of disenfranchised people out there, people who feel like no one understands their position, whatever their position happens to be. No one has ever really listened to them in their lives. No one has ever shown them anything that makes them think that I see you, you exist. You're someone that matters to me. Hey guys, I'm Ashley Don Rivard and you are now into the dawn a provocative podcast that looks at all things taboo, such as suicide, grief, sex, addictions, and more. Each week, I talk with experts who successfully investigate their areas of interest. And if you like what you hear, please remember to subscribe. Following a 28-year career as a CIA operative, Daryl Blocker was awarded the Distinguished Career Intelligence Medal and retired as the most senior black officer in their directorate of operations. After nearly 30 years chasing terrorists and living in 10 different countries, he has now turned his CIA experiences towards battling criminal networks, targeting youth in foster care, and trafficking youth and women in the global slavery and sex trade. Since October 2018, Daryl has worked as an ABC News contributor and COO of Mosaic, a crisis management, intelligence, and security advisory firm. It's kind of like a phenomena in, you know. Right. People are like, oh, wait, I know what that is, but I don't. What I've seen is one of two reactions. People are either over the top, like, oh, my God, that's really cool, or they're just repulsed by it. They're just- Repulsed? Yeah. I mean, Hollywood has not done us a favor in terms of how they depict us. So people think CIA and immediately their brain goes to one of two places. Wow, that's awesome. Or wow, those guys are the worst people on earth. So let me ask you, what is like the number one taboo or misconception the general public has regarding what the CIA is and what it isn't? So Probably one of the best things I ever pulled off the CIA.gov website was the 10 myths that are commonly believed about CIA. Um, The first one is, of course, that we spy on Americans. We, We don't. We don't really care what Americans are doing. Our job has to do with an international nexus. What are the Russians doing? What are the North Koreans doing? What are the terrorists doing? Not what Americans traveling abroad might be doing or saying. It's not our mandate. Maybe about 20% of CIA people are undercover. And the other 80% can write down on their applications when they're applying for a mortgage that I work at CIA. I could never do that because I was under State Department cover. Uh So for 28 years, I could never say, hi, my name's Daryl Blocker and I work for CIA. Then it was, hi, I'm Daryl. I'm a diplomat with the State Department and never revealed CIA. And I retired came out from undercover and now I can only say CIA and it's it's huh. been a it's been an odd uh, a lot transition of rules. there are a lot of rules so with your job specifically in like collecting data you were undercover I was well let me just back this up for a second what what made you want to go into the CIA I answered a newspaper ad um, I was an intelligence officer at the time in the Air Force but I was an analyst meaning analyzing the information that was being sent to me by CIA, NSA, other military components. Mm -hmm. Um, And then my ex-wife saw a newspaper ad and cut it out and mailed it to me. Of course, it was back in the late 80s. And I wrote a 1,500-word essay on, they said, write a 1,500-word essay or less on something you feel strongly about. Mm -hmm. I wrote about the, uh, the Intifada, which was going on between the Israelis and the Palestinians at the time. And someone read it, saw that I could put together a sentence that I had reason, thought, and it started a year-long um, security and um, vetting process for getting my clearances to mm. to issue a job offer. So I was already in the intelligence community, mm-hmm. but I was doing a different job in terms of analyzing and at that time North Korean issues because I was spent my first year in um in South Korea mm-hmm. in 87 88 the year before the Olympics and got an opportunity to meet and engage with a whole bunch of different alphabet soups within the um US government including what I now know to be CIA officers but at the time I had no idea that they were so 
That's the life that I chose and that's the life that I lived for 28 years. So for 28 years, you were sworn to secrecy. I'm sure you still are, right? Like you can't right. talk right. about certain things. Wow. I mean, okay. So what is it like be training for that position and what does that do to your emotional life? So the CIA has five directorates. Operations, which is the directorate of operations where I spent my 28 years and my job was to recruit spies. My job was to go out and find those people who could give us the information that the Russians, Chinese, North Koreans never wanted us to have. And my job was to identify those people who had access to that and recruit them to provide that information to us. So does that mean that you would go to that country right. and recruit people? Right. You, you're typically assigned to, um, because I spent the lion's share of my career on the African continent in West Africa, North Africa, and East Africa, you go to where the embassy, you, you're mm -hmm. working out of the embassy. Mm -hmm. And of course, the American embassy is there, the Chinese embassy, the Russian embassy, all the embassies of countries that we're interested in um, as potential uh, sources of information. And it was my job to, to figure out who within that embassy had access to that information and do everything I could to you know, move them over to the, uh, Other to the side. CIA side. So tell me if I'm going in the wrong direction with this, and this could be a misperception then. So if somebody, I thought like you would go to a different country, you would pretend to be somebody else and maybe um, befriend people there that are civilians or that, you know, you've done research on, on they know this or that. Is that correct? Um, it, it is, but it's not like the FBI being undercover, like okay. uh, Donnie Brasco. Donnie Brasco had to become a mafioso in order to be accepted by the mafia. Mm. So he had a completely different life and uh, name and everything else. My name was only my name, the name I was born with, Daryl Maurice Blocker. I never traveled under another name, never lived under another name. The only thing that I had was that I was a State Department cover but really a CIA officer. And that distinction is when you're living abroad, the fewer people who know you're CIA, the easier it is to operate and right. and gain people's trust. So yeah. that's it it sounds like undercover, but the undercover is more I have to say that I work for the State Department. I'm a political officer, an economic officer, a consular officer. Yeah. Um, but not, you know, infiltrating Al Qaeda and I become a terrorist in training so that I can go, you know, find Al Qaeda in, in Pakistan or in Afghanistan. It wasn't anything like that. But you're also more way behind the scenes. Way behind the scenes, kind of like a puppet master. Puppet, that's what I mean. Yeah. yeah. Like, you know, everything that's going on right. and what needs to happen in Correct. order for the goal. Or you should. That's, you should. That's, that's the goal. Yes. Did you ever feel unsafe? I never felt unsafe. I, I got that same question from both of my children when they got to the ages where I was able to tell them who I worked for. Pakistan was dangerous, but it was in the middle of a, it was probably one of the worst years in um, U.S. history in terms of how we were engaging the enemy. In 2006, 2007, when I did my year uh, in the war zone, we were not faring well in Iraq. We were not faring well in Pakistan. We were not faring well in, in Afghanistan. And it was a very big fear that we could lose this, you know, this war on terror. A confluence of events were able to change things, and I just happened to be there at probably one of the most pivotal uh, points in, in recent U.S. history. But Pakistan was utterly fascinating. They were our partners. People need to understand that when we're abroad, we are working side by side with the, with the people of the country and where we're assigned. If you're in Bulgaria, of course, you're working with, you know, if you're in Sofia, you're working with the Bulgarians. If you're in uh, Lima, you're working with the Peruvians. If you're in Seoul, you're working with the South Koreans side by side with them, chasing targets, uh, training, talking about world issues. So yes, mm. it is, it's a complete, the perfect example of collaboration as you could possibly think of is yeah. the intelligence service and intelligence community. Wow. Interesting. So let's just break down real quick. What defines a terrorist? There, there is an accepted United Nations definition of terrorists. There's a U.S. government um, 
definition of a terrorist, and it's essentially anyone who has a politically motivated um, reasoning for wanting to attack you for your policies. Okay. Um, and politically motivated being being the uh, the um, I guess the the key words there. But history has shown us that one person's terrorist is another person's um, freedom fighter. You know, our founding fathers to the Brits were terrorists. The founders of Israel to the Brits were terrorists. Um, the most recent example of a terrorist leader becoming, going on to be the leader of a country is Yasser Arafat, who the Israelis chased for, for decades and then signed essentially a peace agreement with him and treated him as a statesman. So terrorist is kind of a leading thing mm -hmm. because in order to get bin Laden, guess what? We had to talk to people who were in Al Qaeda. In order to find Abu Bakr al Baghdadi, the former leader of ISIS, we had to deal with people who were ISIS. We don't have the luxury of being able to say good, bad, and everything right. in between but is. Do those people, are they forthcoming with you? Over time, they are. It's about trust. I'll, I'll give ISIS as an example because it's probably fresh in a lot of people's minds. The caliphate within the Islamic Umrah, within their their psyche, and this is where we're going to be able to build this great Islamic kingdom, is a very real thing in Islam. And so when this man arises as possibly the you know their savior, so to speak, there are people who answered the call and who in good faith left the UK, left Canada, left the United States, left France or Belgium or wherever they were coming from, and arrived in a place where they thought they were going to be moving towards one goal and then recognize that beheading people, burying, you know, burning people alive in cages, uh, mass abuse and raping of Yazidi women. Mm. These were things that people came there and said, I, this is not what I signed mm. on for. And then those people start looking for an out. And that out might be an Iraqi intelligence officer that they happen to have in the family or a British, you know, MI6 officer who's in Erbil or wherever it happens to be, those people are looking for a way out. Okay. And the intelligence officers are trained to look for those people, trained to look for those motivations, trained to look for those folks who might have philosophical differences with whoever they happen mm -hmm. to be aligned with. To answer, I guess, why are terrorists radicalized? It's really because of a political standpoint and different views. ISIS has done a really good job of recruiting people. So what they're looking for, there's a lot of disenfranchised people out there, people who feel like no one understands their position, whatever their position happens to be. No one has ever really listened to them in their lives. No one has ever shown them anything that makes them think that I see you, you exist, you're someone that matters to me. And a lot of it is done online. Mm -hmm. And what they're doing is they have contact and then over a period of months, you know, days, weeks and months, they start introducing um, concepts to them. Oh, the Americans are, you know, it's a war against Islam and it, it's not. Or look at what and then they just slowly start introducing beheadings and videos and what oh they're God. doing is the same the them, same right? they're, they're brainwashing them but they build a trust they build they build trust they get them like oh i feel seen i feel people, people feel like they like every human interaction boils down to maslow's hierarchy of needs mm -hmm. they really do and when isis is there to provide whatever it is that the people that are under their control mm. didn't get from whatever governments they were working with, whatever or family. institution or families they were working with. That's the folks that they that they're able Got to find. It. Wow. Interesting. How does, I guess, building your life, deceiving people, mm -hmm. lying, right. how does that affect your emotional and mental health? Were you able to decipher? Were you able to turn it off? We that's what we would call compartmentalization. The same thing that you might read on the front page of your of your New York Times, your Washington Post, your L.A. Times is the same thing that CIA is dealing with. But how that information was collected, you know, the sources and methods involved in the collection of that information 
is as important as the information. So you have to go through life trying to remember, ooh, did I see that on Fox last night? Or is that something that I read in the CIA? Because they, they're talking about the same issues, mm -hmm. but the depth of it is little. So you go through your life weighing which arguments you're going to get into in a, in a bar or in a family discussion. Mm -hmm. And you know that there's more to the story. Right. But because that information is classified, you just have to kind of just kind of swallow that, you know, swallow that down and say, I played the there's shit. right. Basically <laughs> there's more to the story and not one of those, I know something that you don't know right. type of thing, but you're really protecting whoever, because a human being on the other end, whether that other end is inside of Moscow, Beijing, or, you know, Baghdad put their life on the line to give you that. Mm. And analysts mm. are looking at it and say, Hmm, where could this information have come from? Maybe it only came from one or two places and one or two places, two or three people. That's not a lot of people to go through to be able to figure out who leaked this or who provided this. So we're careful about revealing sources and methods. That is the most important thing about being in a spy slash spy handler right. relationship. And, and if I could, CIA officers are not spies. Uh -huh. We recruit spies. Okay. So we handle this, spies. So spies are not CIA. No. They what would they ever tell anyone they're a spy or no? Oh, they have no. to so they just make up a profession. Well they're already in that possession. So um people people typically get this this analogy in real estate location, location, location uh -huh. is like the most important thing. For someone who was involved in human intelligence or human it's about access, access, access. So let's say the, the president and the National Security Council has said, we need to know about, you know, X, Y, and Z for, you know, whatever country. Well, two of them might be impossible to get to, but one of them, you have to figure out how we're going to get to that piece of information. And so you're not looking for an individual, you're looking for a profile of my, who might have access to that little nugget of information. The people who have direct access are, of course, the primary target. But guess what? That guy never leaves the country. We're never going to get to him. But his driver, who's with him and has been with him for 20 years, has been trusted by him, speaks openly around him. And that guy's not going to know everything, but he might be able to provide a tidbit or a piece of mm -hmm. it. And so he has access to the person who has access, if that right. makes sense. Absolutely. So secondhand type of thing. You hire a spy to befriend the driver. Well, or you recruit that or you recruit that driver. To become the spy. Right. That driver oh. would then become so let's oh, just okay. say I know that Kim Jong un's driver has been with him for, you know, since he took over and he travels to the Seychelles once a year. And guess what? I'm going to be in the Seychelles the next time he's in country at the same resort and the same thing where I bump into him, befriend him. And again, this is something that takes period. It doesn't, it's not like in the movies where it happens one time and you run in yeah. and grab someone. It's more like dating. Uh huh. It's exactly like dating. Okay. So the intelligence cycle is spotting, assessing, developing, recruiting, handling, and terminating an asset. An asset is an agent, a source, a spy. Huh. <laughs> I mean, it, there's just so much. Um, oh, like, how do I like? How do you turn that off if that's your position? But how do you decipher or compartmentalize? Like you said, like really, when you're immersed in that, right? Mm -hmm. Because there's so much information, right. and it 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 kind of hits you at different levels, right? It's not just mentally. I mean. It, like this is some heavy, deep stuff and also a lot of weight on your shoulders. Right. I know you're saying like you didn't go out and deceive people, but in general, I guess, could you speak on an end for yourself too? Well, like I didn't how that only go out and deceive people. Listen. No, I know. I'm it's saying about, you didn't. It's about, no, no, no. I'm saying I did and it's uh -huh. about manipulation, but it's also a very, you're doing it for a very, very specific reason. Right. And you have a lot of people making sure that you're staying within the ethical and moral boundaries and expectations of the training that we give. Okay. So I started to say earlier that people in my directorate who do my job, which is the case officer, the operations officer, 
those people have a have a kind of a combination of intellectual, social, and personality traits that other successful people who have made it through the program in the past. That's mm-hmm. how they that's how they hire. So yes, they're looking for Ashley, or yes, they're looking for uh, Daryl, but they're not going to know that Daryl and Ashley have these attributes until we meet you, we interview you, we do put you through the same psychological test that mm-hmm. you know everybody has mm-hmm. taken for you know the last couple of decades. Now everything is done online, mm-hmm. and there's so much more data that wow, Daryl was really successful, and this person fits exactly the same mold as Daryl when he came in the door. But guess mm-hmm. what? 1990s world is not 2020 world. So what worked for me 30 years ago doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work for who they're looking for today. So my point is it's not a checklist. Right. Um, I would say curiosity. I get this question. What's the thing that's most important for someone in your line of work? And curiosity, is it um, connection? Um, Being able to establish and build trust, being able to have conversations and be a good listener. Um, I was once asked what my, what I, what my superpower was. And I said, I don't have one, but if I were going to have a superpower, I wanted to be listening. Mm -hmm. And they just looked at me like, like listening, that's not a very powerful thing. Listening is probably the most important thing that you can, that you can do when you're trying to connect with a, with another human being. Right. Because listening is not waiting for your turn to speak. Listening is listening with your whole body and not just for what they're saying, sometimes what they're not saying. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure in your line of work, right? Like your antenna has to be so high, especially when you're out in the field dealing with people or building those relationships, right? So you're, are you always looking for, like you said, what, what they're not saying, mm-hmm. their behavior, you're reading their body language, you know, like you have to be so in tuned yes. with, yeah. All the time. That and takes it, a lot of it, energy. It's exhausting. It is exhausting. So when you're not operational, when you're not, you know, when you're in a point where you can just sit back and relax and enjoy, you know, enjoy your kids or enjoy your spouse or significant other, then you can really, when you relax, you're completely relaxed. But overseas, it's hard to relax because you're always the target. Espionage is what we do. Espionage is illegal in every country on the planet. So just by virtue of the fact that I was going out to do an operational act, which is pick up an agent for a meeting or, uh, you know, any number of any number of uh, operationally inclined things, you have that person's life in your hands. And not just them, but their families, because Mm. in a lot of cultures, in a lot of countries, if you get captured, yes, you're going to be punished, but they're going to punish everyone, your friends, your family, um, anyone you may have contact with is going to be possibly, you know, suspect in their, in the eyes of that government. So it's a, it's a huge responsibility. Yeah. Would you say you were pretty stressed out then when you were overseas? Nope. Really? No, not at all. Um, I think, (laughs) listen, I think they hire people who can deal with with ambiguity, Uh people who can deal with uh, living in in different cultures. I grew up in different cultures. Uh Um, So I grew up in the heel of the boot, Italy, and Okinawa, Japan. And I spent seven of my first nine years on the planet living outside the United States. So remembering living in the United States was San Antonio, Texas. When I moved there in 1973 and then my dad retired after 20 years. And when I was 11, we moved to Georgia. But by then I'd grown up speaking Japanese. I had been around, you know, Italians and Europeans. And I knew it was a a world and a life that I wanted to be able to continue to, uh, you know, see other cultures. And as great as the United States is, we're not the only great country on the planet. There's a lot of them out there. Mm. And you just have to be open and willing to to look and see um, what those are. And mm. I'm talking about even amongst our, our enemies. Um, Iran is one of the, the Persian empire is one of the most interesting in history. And I spent a lot of time chasing a lot of Iranians in a lot of places on this on this planet and never met one that I didn't like. 
they're the ones you were chasing that you, were quote unquote bad people. Of course, you liked them. Yeah, I think you have to. Well, I saw them as a as a husband or a father or an uncle or someone who just wanted the same thing for their families that I wanted. That I but wanted somebody for mine. who would murder people, let's say, like um, you were able to listen. There, there are elements within every intelligence service that has to be involved in uh-huh. lethal, lethal actions. Most of the Iranians that are serving their government are serving them for the same reason that we serve ours is, you know, paycheck and, Mm -hmm. you know, a sense of adventure or living outside of where they, Mm -hmm. you know, the small place that they grew up in. Mm -hmm. Never really ran into, chased a lot of murderers of uh, people who are Iranian proxies Mm -hmm. and Hezbollah, Mm -hmm. um, Al Qaeda, of course, all over, all over Africa and, and Europe. And, some of those people are actually, they're impressive when you look at how they're able to uh, just think about Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, who was the leader of ISIS for almost 10 years. He's he, he the would, one that He was the one killed. that was captured okay. or uh, gunned down in, in, uh, in the tunnels uh-huh. uh, in Iraq by either Delta or the SEALs, one of our special uh-huh. forces uh-huh. units. Okay. Um, he was a pimp. Oh. He was a uh, drug addict. He was a common criminal, just like Zarqawi before him. And a lot of these guys, you're talking about hardened criminals who have an opportunity to act any way they want without without any you know repercussions other than maybe a drone or you know the, some forces come in to track them down because they know they're targets. But they get to live out their wildest dreams. They've thrown people alive off of buildings. You know, they've burned them alive. I mean, these are things that, that you know, Game of Thrones, whatever <laughs> the worst thing that you saw on right. the Game of Thrones, that is happening as you're listening to this somewhere in the Still? world by ISIS. Yes. I thought, I, I, okay, and I'm checked out. I thought I heard that ISIS was taken care of. No? Do we still need to worry about this? I... Well, we thought we were able to eradicate the Muslim Brotherhood, which was founded in the early 1900s, and it's around 120 years later. ISIS will be around 120 years from now. Now, they might be like Hezbollah, where they are members of the parliament in Lebanon, or they could still be, you know, the rogue, you Mm -hmm. know, group that they are today. Mm. It's an ideology. It's hard to kill an ideology. And when you have someone who is charismatic enough Mm -hmm. to draw others in Mm -hmm. and other like-minded people who will be willing to do whatever it is you want them to do to another human being, that kind of person is able to draw in Manson. Manson was Zarqawi, was al-Baghdadi, was Hitler. They're all the same people. Would you say they're all operating from the same wound then? From the same wound, emotional wound. I mean, obviously, these people got some, you know, deep, deep right. disconnection or, you know, within themselves or aloneness or, you know, yeah. or they're just born, right? Like when you're in those different, uh, like right. brainwashed into like, this is normal yes. to be that way. Right. There, There is a lot of that. So I lived in four predominantly Muslim uh, countries in my in my career. I observed Ramadan in every one of those countries. I'm not Muslim, but I felt I needed to know what it was to experience what was probably one of the biggest religious experiences for the entire religion. And I did it in Niger. I did it in Morocco. I did it in Pakistan. And I did it in Nigeria um, because the part of Nigeria that I lived in was was predominantly Muslim, even though I think the country is about 50-50 Christian Muslim. But anyway, I think it gave me a greater appreciation for the good that is Islam. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of good. Oh. If you think about how they're depicted in mm-hmm. in television, in common, uh, common news, it's not a whole lot different than how the CIA is depicted, just almost always negative. And the same thing goes for, you know, fill in the blank. Mm-hmm. Wow. So interesting. You've lived such a full life you know, full of experience right. and, and you're still very jolly, you know, which is great. Like you, it, I could be wrong, but like, you don't come across like that is like a weight on your shoulders because everything you're saying could really 
you know, weigh someone down emotionally and mentally. And then you come home to your family. And how did that play on your family? When you're working at the CIA and and you're living abroad, all assignments are two years with an option to extend for a third year. So my daughter was four months old when we moved to West Africa. And she graduated, of course, 18 years later from high school in Geneva, Switzerland. Um, Her brother was about 15 months old when we first moved, and he graduated from Kampala High School in Kampala, Uganda. They only went to school in the United States one year, fifth and Mm -hmm. seventh, seventh grade, respectfully. And the rest of them were at international or American schools in all the countries in which we lived. Now, they were pretty much protected from the from the CIA side of it because I didn't involve my children in, in in it. My ex-wife, of course, was aware of who I was and what I was doing. But that's what you would protect a child from. A child, what did you tell them when they were old enough to say, what do you do? They just knew everybody else was work. Everybody else at the embassy, you know, other kids at the school, dad also worked at the embassy. They didn't. Okay. They just they knew. Care. They just knew I was an embassy employee. Mm, got it. One way or the other, they didn't. They didn't think about it. Hmm. So you were able to really cultivate like a good family experience yes. and upbringing. And I don't think I missed a, a a play. I don't think I missed. You know, if they had art yeah. for pre K, you know, yeah, have yeah. the you know, art showing. Of course, you show up at everything because you're living abroad. You're living in yeah. in small cities, and you should be able to get away to see your kids. It's not like being in DC where leaving CIA headquarters, it takes 30 minutes to, you know, to get anywhere and 30 minutes to get back and you only have an hour for lunch and it just Mm. is not conducive. The embassy environments are small. Mm. Uh, Everybody else is living the same world that you are. And of course, being in Africa, we had electricity issues. Water might not be, um, you know, the best water. I never lived anywhere in Africa that didn't have, um, all of our water was, was filtered. Um, it's awesome. in fact, I remember the first time my kids ever drank water coming out of the, the tap. We were leaving Senegal and we we're in Zurich. We had overnight in Zurich. Um, and my daughter saw me brushing my teeth and she's like, no daddy. And she knew that only bottled water is what we would use to wet Uh-oh. our toothbrush. And then she, but she saw me out of the spit and she said, no, 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 daddy. And I said, no, baby, we're in Switzerland and you can drink this water. And about two minutes later, I see she and her brother, they pulled a chair in there and got up to the sink, turned it on and are just literally just drinking handfuls Aww. of water because they had never drank water coming out of a faucet before. And <laughs> it was just such a really cool thing to see. I'm sure. Yeah. Wow. That's so funny. So would you say like the one thing though, that was maybe different in your life is you come home from work and your wife is like, how was your day? You can't really be like, well, this, 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 right? Right. Um, we almost never got into specifics. She of course okay. knew who I was interested in. Um, look in your front page of your newspaper anywhere in the world. And it's probably something the CIA Mm -hmm. is tracking if it's an international or global Mm -hmm. issue. Um, You know, if you look at the Corona virus Mm -hmm. right now, looking at it in the sense of how it's going to impact how governments are able to, to manage. And is somebody going to take advantage of a country who's already really weak and what happens when this leader's deposed and is it going to, you know, domino. So not the virus in and of itself, but the, the unintended consequences of not having strong institutional systems or strong leaders or strong healthcare systems Mm -hmm. or all those things that can cause mad chaos. If Mm -hmm. you're, you know, if you, if you're not tracking and following it closely, the CIA is not spying on anyone in America. It's, really, you know, the threats right. outside of the US. But when you when we were talking about ISIS, I, I it just dawned on me there are people here right. who are working for ISIS, yes. right? Right. And you are tracking them though. Um we are, but in partnership with the FBI. Oh, or okay. or uh, state and local law enforcement. So that's but, their job more so. The yes. FBI. Oh, okay. Once once they once they enter the United States, um then a very different a uh, set of rules are applied to CIA operational officers. Hmm. So, um, and of course we have to abide yeah. by all of our laws and let's just say you're, we know that you're a, uh, an ISIS 
you know, facilitator. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you work for, you know, Acme, you know, Acme company in in Ohio. If that's a U.S. company and you work for it, I don't care what nationality you are, you are considered a U.S. person, mm. meaning you have the same rights as an American citizen when it comes to what the CIA can and can't do um, against that person. Now, you can get waivers and there's ways around it, but it's almost following whatever the FBI were assisting, assisting. The F- assisting the FBI. Yeah. Correct. Hmm. In that line of work, is there a high rate of people... Yeah, dying in that line of work. Honestly, I'm shocked at how few of us actually get killed in um, in some of the places where we go. They put the CIA in places where the military won't go, and they don't put us out there with a lot of, uh, um, you know, that we're not building military bases and arming ourselves. And mm-hmm. and no, we're on the streets talking to people, uh, a lot of like the journalist. And I never really saw the you know, the difference between a, or saw the, the similarities between a case officer and what a journalist does. But now I work for ABC News and I'm talking to these guys, investigative journalists, all the, all, all the time. And it's amazing how closely we go about doing our work. They have the backing of ABC or whoever behind them. And I had the backing of the CIA behind me. But at the end of the day, we're out in places that Outside of being able to talk your way past a group of, you know, group of people setting up a roadblock and just want to shake you down because they're hungry or hardened people are looking for fighters because they've lost so many people in a in a campaign that now they got to go out and snatch people and, and force them into, uh, you know, into mm-hmm. joining their ranks mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and our ability to talk to people, our ability to engage with people, our ability to um, know what the cult, what's culturally acceptable. And how to use their own their own rhetoric against them. That's that's what we're supposed mm-hmm. to be able to to do on the fly. How do I say this? With such a maybe it's even like like you had mentioned, like it's not what you think it is in the movies, but with this level or this idea of secrecy that the CIA has around it, do you know anyone or have you experienced Somebody who has to keep information to themselves. Mm-hmm. If you are dealing with mental health issues or struggling, how is, is there a system set up or is that, you know, do you feel people can express in the CIA, hey, I'm having this issue. I'm having, you know, is there that support and how has that played on in like with suicide inside the CIA? So it's 2020, I would say five years ago, six years ago, when I was working out of CIA headquarters, um, there was a suicide in in the war zone. And um, I got involved because I was one of the senior senior um, officials. And I was there when the family was repatriated with the uh, with their daughter. That is the only suicide that I can think of that I that I was personally involved with. Mm-hmm. Um, I know the divorce rate is really high within people that work in my, in my, but suicide rate is not up there, but the mm-hmm. pressures, mm-hmm. the pressures that lead to people having those thoughts is constantly, constantly there. Um, and Rania, who is the, uh, the officer who, who took her own life had a sense of, I, I, no matter what I'm doing, it's not enough. Mm. She never felt like she could actually contribute. And she was one of our best officers. Mm. Um, and this is coming from the people who I spent three hours on a bus riding to and back from who worked with her, who worked for her, who were her classmates, who knew her from the moment she walked into the building, talked about how good of a boss she was, talked about how fair and open and uh, just driven she was, but driven to the point that it was never enough. Mm-hmm. And she felt less than. And so in the aftermath of that, uh, I started working with our employee assistance program and our clinical psychologist who came up with a kind of an agency wide campaign. Mm. And it was an anti uh, basically you need to be looking for these signs. So mm-hmm. I was a huge part 
of trying to get that message out. And because I was the deputy director of our counterterrorism center, and of course, those were the people who were coming back from the most intense oh, places sure. that, that we have and being able to look them in their eye and make sure that that they're getting everything that they need. But it's kind of like cops or kind of like special forces. You know, we're tough. We can we can gut this out. This is something that I can I can handle on my own or no one's ever going to understand or it's going to stop me from, you know, getting advancing, you know, getting a promotion. Mm -hmm. And none of that has been has been borne out. Um, my my background was in psychology. And so I never really saw mental health as a, a, in a negative light. It was always right. for me, a, uh, a force multiplier, a way of me being able to look at myself in a way that I might not normally had because no one ever pushed me to, to open up or to, you know, to address these things that are inside of all of us mm -hmm. and these voices that are, you know, that are in our heads and, you know, our thoughts become words, our words become actions, our actions become, you know, our character and who we are. And then all of a sudden you've kind of painted yourself into a picture that only you see and everybody else. Oh, mm -hmm. she's fine or he's mm -hmm. fine. Mm -hmm. And then because you're not sharing, because you're too right. afraid to 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 share or because whoever it was that you tried to approach didn't see the signals and, you know, reacted in a way that kind of like, well, I can't bring this up anymore. Right. Um, and I've had this conversation with, uh, um, I also was a, what we call a senior ally for our internal LGBTQ oh. uh, community within CIA. Awesome. And I remember this one young lady who had just come back also from the war zone um, was talking about coming out. Mm hmm was harder than living, you know, living in Iraq for a year and feeling that constant threat of, you know, the guy, bad guys could overrun us at any moment or that guy lied to me. And why is he lying? You know, all the things that come with, with handling, um, handling sources who might not be telling you the truth or might have an agenda where they want to put you in a position where you're going to get ambushed and killed you know you're constantly constantly thinking on high alert all the time yeah and, and coming yeah. down coming down from that so when you're doing that for a year adrenaline and yeah. right and i i saw that a lot so those officers who were just had that 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 need for speed yeah and then you put them back into the regular setting of what a real cia officer is supposed to be doing abroad and not just the the war zone piece of it and you can see it in their eyes. It's literally their, their eyes are constantly moving. And then it's just over a period of time where they recognize that that was an anomaly. That year that I spent out there was yeah. the not the real world. The rest of this is the real world. And then the adjustment to that. And some adjust well. Um, I haven't slept well in 13 years. I've come to take that as and I've talked to doctors uh -huh. and sleep doctors. And it changed me. And I wasn't even in the most dangerous parts. You of, slept better when you were in, would you say you used to sleep fine when you were in these high risk places? Right. But do you think also it could be like this unconscious thing that there, even if you were sleeping, there was probably a part of you like, I kind of have to be ready to jump or run or, mm. you know, on high alert. Right. Yes. And maybe now that you are kind of more grounded and you're in a safe <laughs> environment. I never thought of that. It's. It's now kind of like hitting each other, like, you know, battling right. of that surrendering of that part of yourself. That I, I will look, that's interesting. I'll look into that because I've, I've talked to a lot of people about this and I sleep better than, you know, I'm doing better now than I was a year ago, just because I came off all the, I've been taking sleep, yeah, sleep medication to go to off. sleep. And I said, that's it. I'm not yeah. taking anything else. Even if I just have to stay up every night. And after three nights of not sleeping, my body just adjusted and now I don't mm -hmm. take anything. And if I do, it's because I know I got to sleep really good and maybe once a month as opposed to every night just to sleep enough to, you know, get up the next day and function. I mean, is there a high level of isolation that plays into this job? There is, but mostly it's self-isolation because it's, 
intelligence is a team sport. Okay. You feel when you're actually meeting with an asset, it is you and that asset one on one in in a car, in a hotel room, in a safe house, you know, wherever you happen to be. That's that's the comfort part of it. It's the oh my God, can I get there safely? And now I'm holding the meeting and it's over. Can I get back without getting caught? And so it's a constant, constant mm-hmm. stress on you. But that's what you're trained to mm-hmm. do. And mm-hmm. and in the training, we put you through, you know, scenarios that are impossible for you to succeed because we want to know how you're going to respond mm-hmm. if you if you, you know, quote unquote, fail. Um, failure is an option. And failure shouldn't be terminal. And failure, I think, has got a bad rap. And I probably learn more from my mistakes, like most people, than they do from from their successes. So I always tell people to embrace their failures because failures is what created the light bulb, was what created the car, is what created almost every piece of technology that exists today because people failed a whole mm-hmm. bunch of times before they got it right. And if you're only going to do it once and fail and never do it again, then that's that's a failure. Not continuing mm-hmm. is the failure. Not the fact that you didn't succeed, the fact that you just walked away and said, I can't do this anymore. Yeah, yeah. I mean, also, like, I know when y- y- you interact, right, like with other people, mm-hmm. there's something that becomes alive within right. you. Right. And so with all those people you've met, I mean... My God, I'm sure when you look at things or if you're having conversations with people, especially in America, you're like, I'd be like, oh, my God, your viewpoint is so small. Right. We don't even know this huge scope that you, you know. Right. You can look at things from so many different angles and not be judgmental. But it's also important not to be judgmental for those people who've never been outside of their their area codes or their zip codes or their county or whatever it happens to be. And the same thing exists in, you know, countries around the world, Mm. people only see this one view. Um, You know, the sectarian violence between the the Sunnis and the Shia in Iraq after years and years of intermarrying of, you know, they didn't distinguish. Yes, there's been a big schism since Muhammad died. There's a whole bunch Mm -hmm. of history there. But these people have been living side by side, intermarrying, and then all of a sudden outside forces come in and it'd be like somebody coming from the civil war and starting back over the argument, uh, you know, the South, I'm a Southern or so mm-hmm. I had to use that analogy and to basically create uh, tension between blacks and whites for the purposes of, you know, starting a race war. That is what happened in Iraq under Zarqawi and under ISIS is they separated, they highlighted and pushed these people to the point where like, yeah, they really aren't my enemy. Well, guess what? That's your nephew. And your nephew, his mom is Shia and your dad is Sunni. But guess what? That's still your blood. That's still your neighbor. That's still your friend. And that's still a person. Mm -hmm. And that's what people need to understand that the humanity of who we are and what we do, no matter how bad that person is, there's somebody's son or daughter or neighbor, Mm -hmm. or favorite student, Mm -hmm. or all these things. And I'm always trying to find the connection between me and them. It's easy to see the differences. You're a female, I'm a guy. We both probably got brown eyes, brown hazelless eyes. You got hair, I don't. I mean, (laughs) physically (laughs) seeing differences is, is easy. But looking for the similarities between who we are and how we approach life or how um, those are instant connectors. I love that. Would you say that's one of the biggest lessons you you took from? That is Indonesia? one of that is one of the biggest lessons, and I I don't think it's anything that I learned at CIA. I think I learned it from my well, from my parents and oh. and you know being a Boy Scout and a Cub Scout <laughs> and military and you know all my experiences. People say where am I from, and it's like oh, okay, I've lived in ten <laughs> countries. I'm not really from anywhere anymore because I am a little bit of of all the countries that I lived in. I'm a little bit Moroccan. I'm a little bit Ugandan. I'm a little bit Pakistani. I'm a little bit Italian. I'm a little bit, you know, 
every all my experiences have created this, you know, this kind of semi interesting person with a background that to me isn't unique because everybody that I've been living around for the last 30 years is doing the same thing. But now I'm in a different world and people are fascinated by all things CIA because they see the Hollywood side of it. What I'm trying to show them is we're just like everybody that's out there listening. You could be CIA. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. You can. You got to have the right reasons for doing it. If you're looking at it in a James Bond, you know, Jason Bourne kind of way, then it's you're not you're not going to do well. But it's completely achievable to join the intelligence community and give back in a way that you might not have ever considered. Mm. That to me was the important thing. Mm. Growing up in other places, learning other languages and um, giving my kids the same opportunity that my parents gave me to, to grow up and see other other places in the world that most people only read about. That's really awesome. So now you're on your second chapter. Third chapter. So Third first chapter. chapter would have been military, uh, Air okay. Force, and then CIA's second chapter. And now I'm the chief operating officer of a of a firm called Mosaic, okay. uh, based out of New York. Um, we uh, intelligence security um, con- um, advisory firm. Okay. Everything from executive protection to cyber, um, with individuals, with corporations. So that's the, I'm tapping into what I've been doing for the past three decades. And then, um, you know, ABC News also, my background in North Korea, Iran and terrorism is what I've been hired for. But my my passions are the Peace for Kids, which is an organization I started volunteering with here locally um, in 2016. So I'm just past four years so Peace for Kids is a, a nonprofit that works with um, foster, youth in the foster mm-hmm. system. And we try not to say foster kids mm-hmm. because they're not foster kids. They're kids who have been trapped within a system that is known as the foster system. They don't like to be referred to as foster kids because guess what? At the end of the day, they're just kids who have done nothing wrong. They've got an adult in their life that was irresponsible. All the circumstances were way beyond their control but yet they're caught in a system where 35,000 here in Los Angeles County alone. So it's a huge issue. And it was instant, it was instant love. The first time I went and I got elected to the board a year ago. And so that's how I spent all my Saturdays working with, with foster youth. And um, that's my give back, Mm -hmm. so to speak. I just want to thank you for taking the time to sit down with me. I know you take your work and very seriously, which is as you should. And, you know, you you don't just talk to anyone. So it really means a lot to me. This conversation was so enlightening and interesting. And I feel like I was just enlivened even more. It was, it was fascinating. I, I, I got so much from this conversation and a deeper understanding, which I wanted, which is why I wanted to talk to you on what is the underbelly of all of this separation, terrorism, and what it's like to live in, in a CIA shoes. So thank you for being so open and honest and thank you for the work you do. Thank you so much for having me. That's it for today's podcast. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen today. Please let me know what you think. Leave a comment, share, and we'll be back next week with a new episode. 